in the name of the Privacy Hub, I wish to welcome you here. Also in the name of Gloria Gonzalez Puster, who is uh, the leading one of the leading powers behind the Brussels Privacy Hub. Um, this is the second meeting of our uh, new series, the Meet the Author series. Um, and it's the first time that we try to do this not only here live, but at the same time uh, record the, the, the session and it will be available on the website in some time. Um, it's a series we started just, and we will continue it in the course of uh, uh, 2018 with a few sessions. Dates and subjects are not yet completely ready, but anyone who has ideas is always welcome to contact us. But uh, that's also for later, it can also be done later. Um, <coughs> I found it great that so many people showed up. Uh, unfortunately, we missed one of the speakers, uh, Nathalie Helberger, who uh, had to stay in Amsterdam with some uh, flu, I think. So, a pity. Also, in terms of balance, not only because of the gender balance in our panel, but also because of the fact that we are in our panel now moreover data protection specialists and not consumer specialists. But there is Agustin who will uh, help us completely to uh, work out. Um, it, it is the idea that we start with some introductions and then at a certain moment uh, the discussion will take place with the audience, with you all. Um, first, I will give the floor, I will, I will, but not now yet, to Christian de Cunha from the EDPS. Gloria gonzalez Fuster is next to him uh, from the Hub. Augustine Reina from the European Consumers Organization, Beuk, And at the end, uh, Frederik Zuiderveen Borgesius from the Amsterdam University. Um, those were a few words to start. Uh, if you need a date, if you want to lay down a date already on the 20th of February, there will be a new event of the Hub, but Gloria will explain that a little bit later. Um, we will start, but before I give the floor to the others, I will abuse my own. Uh, I will abuse my own time, your time, by getting a few uh, things out as starting points. In the first place, I think I find it very pleasant and revealing that now we are a bit out of our data protection silo. It's These are two different worlds, data protection and consumer law, and these are <coughs> worlds which should be much br brought much more together. Uh, personally, I had the privilege to be at the start of trying to bring this all together in a 2014 paper of the European Data Protection Supervisor, but uh, things are continuing, moving further, and I think this article is really a good example of how different legal professions can work together and how they should work together in a digital environment. Of course, uh, when you read the paper, you also get some questions. Those questions are, are things we're going to discuss here. What I like of the paper in any case is the, uh, is the emphasis on fairness and on transparency. Fairness, transparency, two linked notions, no notions which you can also see in the Article 29 Working Party on Data Protection. They, gave, they issued a paper on transparency last week, and there they mentioned clearly transparency as part of fairness. Uh, a question raised by the paper was about uh, the need for this cooperation of these two legal areas, and the main question is basically, that was in the part start of the paper, <coughs> can data protection alone not deliver sufficient protection? And the answer of the paper, I think, was no. But I'm curious why that's no. But I hope that we will hear about it a bit more. Uh, other questions from the paper, which I found extremely interesting, is especially related to this new environment where services are offered for free, so-called free services, which com are not completely free because we pay with our personal data. Uh, interesting is a question which I also saw a little bit in the paper whether or not uh, when services are offered for free there nevertheless is a contract and the essence of the, the existence of a contract is important both in the area of data protection <coughs> as in the area of consumer law. Another issue is what is the notion of a counter performance, uh, counter performance in the 
especially when we talk about these free services. Data are this counter how counter performance, but how does this work and how to make people realize that their data is used? That links to which I read about in the article as well about reasonable expectations in the digital content directive. How does this all relate to purpose limitation, for instance, in data protection? Questions to be asked and answers to be given, I hope. Um, consent unfair and unfair, and unfair commercial practices is also another issue which is quite, quite important. And what I liked from the article in particular was the, the explanation of how weaker parties should be protected. And weaker parties play a big role in consumer law, we know, but also in data protection. I find it very useful to mention not only children, elderly, but also the profiled user as a weaker party. I find that very creative and uh, I'm curious to hear more about it. And of course the main issue, which is somewhere everywhere, is whether personal data can be used or t as tradable goods. Whether as an individual you can, uh, you can uh, say, I don't need my, my data to be protected, I, I don't need my fundamental right to be protected, I give it away as tradable goods. Whether or not it's possible, that's a question which is quite important. Some issues I did not find in the paper, which I find interesting, for instance, how this GDPR, the exhaustive EU law regulation on data protection interferes with a number of minimum harmonization rules in consumer law. How does this all work together in practice? I'm curious. I'm also curious about the difference in traditions. What role does this play? Uh, data protection is traditionally seen as a form of public law, administrative law, whereas consumer law is <coughs> mainly contract law, ma mainly, mainly civil law. And does that make a difference? That's a question to be asked. And there's also related to that the difference in enforcement. Public enforcement by DPAs, by data protection authorities, versus mainly private enforcement, I think, in the area of consumer law. Curious to hear more. Finally, uh, I read <coughs> a lot in the paper about con uh, consent and consumer law, but I would also be interested to see how consumer law notions could play a role in the legitimate interest test, which is a test for data processing in, uh, in data protection. Uh, those are the questions I would like to be answered, but I'm not, I'm just moderating here, so that's already more than I should ask maybe. But I would give now the floor to the first speaker, Christian de Cunha. Uh, thank you, Hilke. Thank you, um, uh, Gloria, and, and for the invitation. Um, I, I read this, the article when it came out, um, but you gave me an opportunity to read it again much more carefully. So um, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent piece. And um, uh, you mentioned the EDPS opinion from 2014, and uh, which I worked on with Hilke, and um, it <coughs> w what you've done in this paper is 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 like is like an e an expansion and an updating of of what we try to do by looking at a comparative um, uh, doing a comparative law exercise, looking at um, data protection, consumer, and also antitrust. Um, a lot of the emphasis. Uh, since then has been on privacy and competition and data that that seems to have been the the sexiest topic for for lawyers in particular um, for for reasons we can go into um, but I think it's very important that this this um, this connection between um, the rights of a consumer and the rights of a data subject is 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 interrogated um, because these are constructed um, concepts and um, they have their own history, and um, you know, we we think in EDPS that you know the the barriers are starting to fragment because of the what's happening in the digital environment. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk for the next 12, 13 minutes about um, uh, basically three or four things. Uh, the first is just some reflections on. Um, data protection and consumer law in the light of, of what um, Frederic and, and, and um, Augustine and Natalie have said in their article. Um, I'd like to suggest some, some important context of what's happening in the market, um, which um, in my view makes this question more urgent than ever of the links between the two areas of law. Thirdly, I wanted to, the, addressing some of Hilke's opening remarks, the, 
the the link this link between fairness and transparency consent and accountability um because it's very much a question of where you place the burden of the need to act um whether you you need to put it on the informed consumer or on the responsible accountable trader if you like or or um or con data controller um and then lastly um you know because we're representing a regulator um what do we what do we do in practice how do we operationalize it the article says at the beginning and at the end that there are exciting opportunities um i agree but um i think what we need to do in the next stage is to look at how that can be done and what we've done actually in our sort of journey through thinking about these issues is there was the 2014 paper but then there was one which we probably la published last year uh, where we talked about coherent enforcement so we're we're starting to think about how to get regulators together to to share ideas and and to try to work strategically on um areas where the consumer could be at risk of harm uh so uh when data protection and consumer protection um i understand uh the the main areas are overlap of, of, as consisting in a in a, a handful of basic questions um question one is what is the deal what is the what is it that is taking place between the the controller and the data subject or the the trader and the consumer um secondly um, how do you know if, if one part, one side of that deal has broken down, one side has reneged? Um, thirdly, how do you get redress in that in that um, in that circumstance? Um, and how do you get out of how do you get out of the deal? How do you withdraw? Um, and consumer law and data protection law seem to be approaching this the, these issues, uh, the, these questions uh, from different different angles with different instruments. Um, but ultimately, they are they're valueless if there isn't an, a mechanism for enforcement. Um, so uh, we're trying to understand what are the what are the incentives and sanctions um, for a company, for example. Doesn't have to be one, but if if you're talking about consumer law, what are the incentives and sanctions um, presented to a trader in um, how they um, how they um, <coughs> sell their 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 goods or service. Um, now, different countries of different member states have different um, approaches to consumer law. Um, you have uh, those who ha you have some countries with a very comprehensive, protective framework, um, particularly in uh, in southern Europe. Um, uh, you have uh you have ones which are more of a uh, a hybrid between um sub social market intervention and and the liberal economy which is tends to take tends to be characterized germany and france and then you have the more liberal um approaches in the uk and ireland where they um they 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 try to privilege market solutions it doesn't necessarily mean that it's weaker in practice um it's for debate um but I know from an anecdotes of talking to different regulators that there are um, that that corporate lawyers will choose which area of law to 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 litigate in. Um, in, all, in other words, if there is if there is an indication of a violation, um, they would probably prefer it to be dealt with under consumer law than under antitrust, for example, because the the fines are, are just in a different um, you know scale of magnitude. And um, it's interesting to see now the the new kid on the block, uh, data protection, how that affects it. But even there, uh, I've heard that you know there is a tendency to say, oh well, um, that's a data issue. So um, you know, pushing it in in towards data protection law. Um, but now data protection law has much stronger sanctions at at, at its um, at its service. That um, this this may change. Um, I'm not going to talk much about antitrust, but where we we do think it's relevant in this general context, and the reason is that antitrust is supposed to be aiming towards maximising consumer welfare. Um, that's there's that word consumer, but they have a, a slightly different, slightly abstract notion of what the consumer is. Um, but nevertheless, we think it's important, um, uh, partly because of concentration and mergers in the market, but also because the um, uh, obligations should be scalable 
and what antitrust does is it, it gives you it's an, it's the opportunity to 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 discipline the most dominant companies the biggest companies and to try to set down some standards about what what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior in the market which then competitors will tend to uh, will tend to emulate that's not always the case but that's why um, I think you know some sort of reference to to the role of antitrust might have even made the article even stronger um, now the second point uh, on context um, I'm trying to we're, we're, I'm always trying to think well, you know, what is it that's actually changed um, in the way that people are interacting through through the digital medium as opposed to uh, before the the digital turn um, humans as economic actors have always wanted to extract a maximum value whether they're selling something or buying something um, and then if you, and, and, and also and even as the pre sort of digital age if you look at the um, I was never a big fan of Mad Men but I did watch the first episode and it's 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 fascinating to see how their um, their their desire to manipulate people is is you know it's as old as it's as old as mankind so it's it <laughs> so what what is it, what is actually happening that's different now that we're the reason why we're having this conversation um, uh, lots of people would argue and I think we agree that there is there is a monopoly problem in the digital environment that um, there has been extraordinary concentration in the market um, I was reading in today's Financial Times a report from McKinsey saying that 80% of the corporate wealth is held by 10% of the companies which are rich in intellectual property and all the top companies rich in intellectual property are, are tech platforms um, so these companies have been dominant in their markets for over a decade. Um, <coughs> the problem is uh, that antitrust analysis is can be used in different ways to argue whether or not they're even in, a sa in the same market or, or dominant. So you tend to get interminable legal discussions before you even get onto the question of, of harm. Um, also, and, and this is what the this is what another good thing about the article is that it. It, it engages what w w w with what we've been calling the post-price post economy. So um, people are when they most of our interactions when we go uh, when we're connected are not um, made possible by you know monetary exchanges. So we're not handing over our credit card. Um, what I thought was really interesting, which I hadn't noticed before, in the um, unfair. Um, sorry, what, what, what's this acronym I've written here? Uh, um, unfair commercial practices directive article 6 it says any in information that is likely to make someone take a transactional decision that, that uh, he or she would not have taken otherwise um, I think that's crucial um, and I don't think it's been really um, uh, re really thought about uh, because um, in the digital environment the transaction tends to be opaque people don't really know what they're getting what they're giving in return for what they're getting um, what they're getting seems great in in many respects um, uh, compare it with uh, when you go and buy a banana you know what you're getting with a banana and also you assume that it's safe to eat because there are certain standards which apply um, <coughs> compare that with what you get with a, a cheap IOT device or um, artificial intelligence enabled service um, what is what is so in other words what is the transaction that's taking place and uh, the article mentions the work of Tim Wu uh, which is my Christmas reading although I read his article but I haven't read the book um, the his book about the called the attention merchants mm -hmm. well, it, this is what I would appreciate your feedback on I mean I, I think that attention is a privacy issue it's not data protection it's privacy because it's limited you only have so much attention in the day and it's um, and it's intimate, almost always intimate. So it's something deeply connected with, with your own person and how you choose to spend your time. <coughs> uh, and there's the famous quote from the CEO of Netflix, um, where he said that um, sleep was their one of their three greatest competitors. <laughs> um, so all of this stuff about um, you know cold, cold calling, cold cold unsolicited calling uh, marketing on the telephone um, the the role of digital assistants the role of the, the fact that the, the 
the standard of autoplay that things will automatically play but without you even in having to engage with it. All of this stuff is, is the attention economy. And um, uh, I think uh, there's a lot more work to be done about whether the right to privacy is being infringed by a company which deliberately attempts to maximise or to monopolise attention, uh, to, to addict ourselves. And there's work by people like Tristan Harris, which is really um, interesting on this, um, who's worked in Silicon Valley. Uh, so the the so the question of post price what is what is the price it's really in interesting this distinction between price and um, uh, uh, consideration or um, counter performance um, <clears throat> I'd like to suggest that you know price isn't necessarily the amount of data that you have to disclose it could also be the extent to which your freedom to ch to, to to consume content. Uh, in a walled garden, at what extent is that a um, uh, is that a price that you're paying to consume a service? To what it, to, to consume a service? To what extent is having your your search results dictated by an algorithm, which is opaque? It, how, to what extent is that a price that you're paying? Um, to what extent is your inability to port information between services? Um, so. Moving on, uh, data protection and consumer protection are there to try to redress imbalances, serious imbalances in these transactional relationships. Um, and um, again, the article does a great job in explaining how uh, through at least three sort of separate consumer protection instruments, as well as the GDPR, you could, you could, you could see bringing a case on behalf of, a, of an individual on the grounds of poor or misleading information. Um, the trouble is, uh, I read I read um, a few years ago um, a book by um, uh, uh, two American academics, Ben Shahar and Schneider. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they they published a book called More Than You Wanted to Know, and it and it and it criticizes um, the standard approach to consumer protection and the Consumer Rights Directive, um, in that it relies on the assumption that the informed consumer will make the right choice. Um, and, and it criticises the over-reliance on disclosure rules, which we would call, I think, um, um, the right to information. Um, so the question is, like, w w uh, have we got, you know, within consumer law, is there, yeah, the, the, the perspective is very much on, you know, the consumer having the right information in order to make a choice, but where th the market uh, itself, wh where, th where the, the transactional space is opaque, and like one side has access to more information than the other, one can judge the value of a transaction better than another one. That gets into what Joe Stieglitz would call an, a highly inefficient information market. So um, you then we then move on to you know, the, the the notion in the which is mentioned in the article of the concept, the principle of accountability um, in the GDPR where that puts the onus on the, um, the controller to act in a way which is responsible and minimises harm to the individual. Um, so it's, you don't put all of the, the burden on, the, on, on the, the data subject to act in a rational way. Um, <coughs> so the, the interaction between these different uh, uh, provisions is going to be, uh, is going to be crucial. And then uh, this is the last point uh, before I move on to what we do next uh, is um, I, I was I was waiting for the article to talk about um, the reason why you can't trade in personal data under EU law, and you get to it only in the conclusions, almost as an afterthought. But we've we've caused controversy this year in a, in an opinion on the Digital Content Directive, where we said that you know you can't trading in personal data may take place. Um, but so does trading in body parts, live human body organs. That doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean that the law should 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 bless it and say this is what we're going to regulate. So um, the point is that you cannot um, you you cannot turn into um, an economic um, currency uh, something which is connected to human human dignity, such as um, information or attention. Um, for that matter. So finally, what, what we do, um, well, there's um, th these these kind of academic work like this with, with input from an NGO, uh, 
is 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 really important to try to keep the pressure up on the regulators to to do something and to talk to each other more. Um, we've set up something called the Digital Clearinghouse to bring them together um, and go through issues um, which are of common concern. Uh, and we need to look at the the areas for overlap where regulators can can actually work together and decide what's the best area of law to pursue. So uh, that's all from me. Congratulations on a really interesting article. Okay, thank you, Christian. <coughs> this, gives, <laughs> this gives us some more richness on in this debate. I think it uh, becomes more and more uh, valuable to, to think about all these different issues. Tradable goods, etc. And the fact that you can trade your personal data. But that's not a question I want uh, Gloria to answer. She has the floor just to react on the article as such. Okay. Hello, everybody. I uh, will try to be brief because I understand you came here to the Meet the Authors event, so you want to meet the authors. It's a pity we don't have the, the main author, but we probably found a way to get her to Brussels at some point. So uh, just to uh, follow up on what Hilke was saying, there will be another event more specifically on data as a counter performance. It's planned for the 20th of February. It's not yet officially announced. This is something that you, information that you get because you came here. I can tell you it will be at the premises of the European Data Protection Supervisor. So you will, the registrations will be open. And I think we can probably not solve today all the open questions that we have about the consumer law and data protection, but we can continue the conversation then in, in February next year. For me, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful subject. It's very, a very interesting subject. And uh, the, the, the article was uh, very, very interesting to, to read. It's called the, the perfect match. I don't know if the perfect match exists. Does the perfect article exist? Well, we thought maybe this one could be the perfect article, but I managed to find a typo that it makes it not the perfect uh, article. And I have to say it's, it's a very unlucky uh, typo. I have to say it's on the footnote number one, and it says that the right to the protection of, of personal data is uh, recognized as a right in Article 7 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Ah, oh, yeah. How can somebody write this and, and no reviewer spot this? How oh, no, is science going? So uh, it's, it's, there's, despite this typo, it's a very, very good article. It's a recommended reading. I hope you, you have read it because I, I, will, I will react to a series of things, a series of points that have already been raised, perhaps from a slightly different perspective, from a, a more uh, an academic perspective. And uh, I think it w was a mention of data protection being the new kid on the block, and I think that's the case in this. Uh, perhaps data protection is stronger in a way because it's recognized in Article 8 of the Charter as a fundamental right and consumer law, not uh, the rights of the consumer, not as, as a fundamental right. But still, uh, data protection is somehow the, the, the newest uh, thing that we still have to understand. So we will try to think about the relations, the interactions between data protection law and consumer protection law. We uh, have to deal with something that we know more or less perhaps or you hopefully know well and then something that we don't really know that much we, we try still to theorize what is data protection law about we have theories we have uh, impressions but we are not sure about all the points and this is what uh, i will try to explain it is not as such a big problem so consumer protection law also went through s a similar historical path i have to uh, share an anecdote that is not even mine it's uh, from my father he used to be involved in advocacy for consumer rights in the 70s, and like the, the highlight of his advocacy participation was that he r uh, managed to get a, a meeting at the Ministry of something in Madrid, so he was very proud. He went to the meeting in Madrid, ah, we are received by this guy. I, they explained we have this consumer protection uh, representation uh, that we protect consumers, blah, blah, blah. And the guy was listening, yes, yes, yes. And after the presentation, uh, so they said, do you have any questions? Said, yes, uh, so who are these consumers? No, that, that was the question, but really, are these like users of drugs? What, what, are, what are consumers, no? <laughs> and, and they were, uh, oh yes, consumers, we, it's like people, when consu they consume, they have, we call them consumers because they have rights. And, and I think that's uh, more or less what the state where we are with data protection law, that we, we are talking about data subjects and the rights of the data subjects, but people, if you tell them, ah, oh, we are, I'm worried about the, the rights of the data subjects, they will ask you, who are these data subjects? Who are these people? And you have to uh, try to explain that in this, it's all of us, it's you. Uh, when your data is processed, we are all data subjects and there we ha therefore we have uh, rights. Because there's uh, not a lot of uh, clear view of how we protect data subjects, what do data subjects want. It's easier, it's tempting sometimes to say, well, let's, let's protect those data subjects as consumers. 
we now understand more or less that people uh, have rights as consumers. So it is indeed a uh, temptation to say, well, we can protect them as consumers and, and as consumers, as citizens have rights, data subjects have rights and, and then we, we can follow this path. This is something that it's commented on the, on the article because it is indeed the, the premise of this recognition of data as a counter performance and then makes uh, those who accept the, the sharing of data consumers. We, we are told that's a good thing because then you're, you're protected as a consumer. And my question to you is, uh, do we really need this? Do we really need to have this new provision in European Union law to have data subjects protected as consumers? And I'm thinking about the, the case now uh, in front of in Luxembourg with Max Schrems. I don't know if you have been following. This is a, a prejudicial uh, uh, question on whether Max Schrems can act as a consumer uh, because he's suing Facebook, no? And there is the is this question, is he a consumer? And the question is really, uh, there uh, has been an opinion by the Advocate General, is Max Rems a consumer and can he do this? But there are doubts, we can discuss this, but uh, the question of whether anybody else could be a consumer when they are interacting with Facebook is not, not discussed. So it seems to me that if anybody else would try to sue Facebook as a consumer, using consumer law in Austria at least, it would be fine. So if, if he can do it, if it's fine, if you, if you are, the people who are on Facebook are already consumers and they have already consumer right, why do we need now a new provision saying, ah, to get protection as consumer, you need to recognize data as a kind of performance? I'm not sure I understand it. But in any case, if we need a new provision to be protected as consumers in that case, then is the recognition of data as a kind of performance the only way to do this? No, probably not. So. Again, a second question, do we really need to go to this path, which is, it has been mentioned, a very, very controversial uh, path. I think the, the image of uh, the body, body parts is, is a good one. The, the question of blood also, so to, to, to um, summarize uh, my favorite example, is that imagine that w we all have a, a, a protection as patients, as patients, when we, we are patients, we have some, some rights, but we, we want to strengthen this protection as also being consumers and say, well, sometimes we go to hospitals and we receive some medical treatment, we have this right to medical treatment, but you know what, uh, some companies said you don't have the right to get this for free. We could give you this for free, but our business model is not to give you this for free. In exchange, we ask for your blood. That's very easy, that's their business model, very fine. And what do we do in front of this situation? Do we just say, well, that's not legal? Or do we say, oh, mm, if it's a, it's a business model, perhaps we should make this legal. And this is what we are now saying, because some companies decide that they want to have access uh, to your blood to give you medical treatment, we just make this legal. So I think it, it's pr conceptually problematic. But yes, so coming back to, to the article, I think this question of, of uh, understanding what is data protection law about, is uh, perhaps too easily solved, I would say. It's, uh, you, you're, you're using as a strategy this idea of being, it's about fairness, and fairness is very closely linked to consumer protection law. Indeed, <laughs> they are both somehow concerned about fairness, but then is it really, what do we mean when we think of about data protection law as being about fairness? And I have uh, two possibilities. So. Uh, there's actually a very good article by Jeff Olos and, and, and Damon Clifford on this question of fairness in, in data protection law. F there are basically two ways of understanding fairness. Fairness has been this fair processing that you have. So the processing of personal data has to be fair. So it's a narrow understanding. Fairness is something, uh, one of the, the properties that data processing has to have. Or fairness in a very broad way, which I think is more like the, the direction you're, you're taking. Say data protection law is about making all data process pro uh, processing fair. And then you have to say, well, what does this mean concretely? It doesn't mean that the processing has to be just fair. It means that you have to protect data subject rights, that you have the obligations of the controllers, that you have independent supervision. So data protection law is about fairness to me only if we then split this into different components and we say, well, data protection law is basically about these three components, rights, obligation, supervision. That's what data protection is law is about. I don't, I'm not sure about whether calling this fairness is really, really helping us because fairness has so many meanings. It's like, could we say data protection law is about l lawful process processing? Yes. But what does it mean? Lawful processing, it can be interpreted in so many directions. But I'm not sure that this is really helpful. That's uh, one of the, of the false friends of this relation between data protection law and consumer law, this question of fairness. There's another false friend that looks very similar, but is it similar? And that's the question of weakness, the, the weakest part. Indeed, consumer prote protection is about protecting the weakest part. 
indeed in data protection law we try to protect the weak but in a very strange way and i've been trying to think like for a long long time about how do we think about the weakness of the data subject in data protection law it's, it's a very uh, strange way because you mentioned this question of asymmetry indeed the reason why we have privacy laws, data protection laws, is because we understand there's a basic asymmetry between the data subject and the data controllers. And this asymmetry of power is reinforced by the processing of data. The more you process data about everybody, the more you, you get powerful. And as a data subject, you, you, you get less, you get powerless. So we have laws to make this weaker data subject uh, stronger, in a way. And then this very weak data subject, we entrust him or her the possibility to consent or not consent to data processing, to take meaningful decisions about what is happening to their personal data. So it's, it's a bit con it looks contradictory because it, you think, well, if he's or her is, they are, they are so unaware of, of what happens to the data, if they are so small in front of such big companies, how can they even consent to something? So this is why we try to say, well, consent is not consent, true consent when, when this imbalance is too unbalanced. But when is the balance not so unbalanced? It, it's a bit contradictory. And for me, the only way to understand this, this apparent contradiction is to say that actually this, they are indeed the weakest part, but th they, are they are less weak, the data subjects are less weak when they are in this general architecture, when indeed the controller being stronger has to comply with the principles. Th there is supervision, so you get, indeed you're a weak data subject, but you're less weak, and you have the possibility to consent in a, in a safe way because of the general data protection law that it's there. So you're, you're only perhaps apparently weak. I come now to, I think it's already the, the, the final first friend that I, that I think there is, just bringing some confusion of, about for the relation between data protection law and consumer law, and that's the, the notion of information. So information, I think you, you, you already mentioned this, information is, is very important in, in, in for consumer law. And what I know about uh, consumer protection law is that actually uh, the use, the way in which information plays a role, it's like to counter the paternalistic tendencies of consumer law. So we, th we tend to think, being outside of consumer law, that consumer law is very paternalistic, that it's about protecting the consumer, but actually information plays a different role. It actually gives the possibility to consumers to make free choices. Not, not the right choice, but their own choice. So the idea is that we are not telling people, don't eat sweets because they, you will get fat. We are we are obliging companies to sell the, the sweets, saying, well, this is giving you 80% of the sugar that you need in, in for, for the whole year. If you think it's fine, go ahead. That's So consumers are, are free. They, ha they have to receive the information and then make free choices. I think that's the way it works, basically. Does it work the same way in data protection law? Do we get information to make, make free choices? Well, we don't. Why do we get information in data protection law? It's a bit, uh, also, uh, there, there are di different reasons why we get information. We get information under the transparency requirements. So companies are obliged to give us information. We also get information for the informed consent. If we consent, we have to give uh, receive information. But do we receive then information to discriminate between one, between one controller and the other? You could think that's the case, but the, the court in, in Luxembourg is saying no, that's not the case. There are a couple of very interesting uh, judgments uh -huh. that I even have the, the, the numbers. One is uh, Telecom and it's uh, from, uh, yes, Deutsche Telecom from uh, 2011, but it was then, uh, it came back on a Tele2, Tele2 case in, in 2017. And it's a, a very specific, actually a very specific provision of the e-privacy directive, which does not mention consent, but it, this has been interpreted as being about consent. It's about the, the possibility for you as a subscriber of a communication service to consent to your data being shared in public repositories. So you have a telephone number and you accept that the company that gives you the number will share this information to other uh, companies. And the question is, uh, does this consent, uh, what, what, what are the boundaries of this consent? So th there have been two cases. In one ca case, somebody had consented to give, uh, p a company had the consent of the, 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 the subscribers to share the information with another company and then another a third company wanted to have the, the, the data and the question is do, do we need to actually get the consent of the people because they consented to for us to give the data to this company not to this company and the court say well you, you get this what this consent in data protection law is not a selective right 
you accepted that the data will be shared so people can call you. It doesn't matter whether it's this company or this other company. You, don't, you cannot use it as a selective right. Now transpose this into the banana example or the supermarket example. You enter the supermarket. You say, I want some tomato sauce for my pasta. Okay, pick up what, what you want. You pick the tomato sauce when you go to the to the to the to pay. Actually, they just replace this tomato sauce with another random tomato sauce and say, well, you wanted some tomato sauce. That's what you wanted. You cannot now complain that you wanted this specific tomato sauce and not the other. That will be meaningful as a consumer. You are expected to actually choose and, and make contribute to, to the efficiency of the market with those choices. But in data protection law, you don't, you're not granted this selective right. You just consent to something or to or you don't consent. If you consented, you cannot then say, well, I consented to this company, not to that company. So I think there, the, the role that this information is, is supposed to play is very different. And if it's uh, the role of information is different, the way in which we envisage, uh, imagine the decisions of the data subjects as opposed to consumers are different. So how compatible are really theoretically those, those two, two fields? So that will be more, my, my, yes, more, uh, more abstract uh, discussion. Uh, before I finish, I wanted to, to just come uh, bring a, a, a point that I think perhaps should have been mentioned in the article, but of course it's not an article that can cover everything about the interactions between data protection and consumer law, but for the future, and, and you were mentioning this question of uh, regulators interacting and talking to each other, I think it's very, very important, but there's something else, I think it's organizations, non-profit bodies, yeah. and, 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 and associations that have now to interact, so I'm talking about Article 8, 80 of the GDPR, so that's, uh, you, you know there's this new article in the GDPR, about the right of representation, so data subjects can be represented by, by organizations, and depending on the member state, those organizations can have uh, different types of powers of representation of the data subjects. This is new. This is very uh, done in a very strange way because there's no harmonization of this of the powers of those uh, associations, which is, I think, very frustrating and even incompatible with the nature of fundamental right of data protection, that we, we think data subjects can be represented, but they are represented in different ways in, in member states. I don't know whether this, this makes sense. It's actually a very funny uh, article, but because when you read it, it says uh, it's about the possibility of uh, associations uh, to represent data subjects, but it has to be organizations, associations, not profit bodies, active in the area of the protection of the data subjects' rights and freedoms. And for me, this is really an example of what happens when you cut and paste too much things in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a GDPR. What are the data subjects freedoms? I don't know, the freedom not to consent. I don't know, it's a very strange thing. But so if there's a, an association organization active in this area, they can then represent the data subjects. What we see now is that actually there are uh, organizations that are uh, being uh, created, organizations that had never done this kind of uh, representation that want to do it. And I think that there, there is, there is really a lot of uh, room for uh, exchange, I think, or room for exchange. There's a need for exchange between those organizations representing the data subjects and the organizations that represent the, the consumers. I have received myself questions about uh, what is the redress in this context? How can you, as an organization, calculate redress? I think uh, there are many, many questions that consumer uh, organizations have been addressing, that they, they have experience, they have knowledge, and this knowledge should get into those new uh, organizations, bodies that are being just uh, seeing the light now. I hope ideally with the, even with the support of the European Commission, with the support of somebody who cares for to see those organizations actually really effective and active. So I will just stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, one of the new elements you mentioned, I think, was the were the false friends in French, the faux amis, a thing which I love in French as a term. I use it a lot when I, when I switch between languages, but it's also good to switch maybe between two different areas of law. I think that that was important to to see a bit that. Quite often when we talk, we use the same terms. We talk about different things. Fairness is, of course, the the main main idea because fairness can be a very precise uh, prescription, but can also be an ethical notion, for instance. Um, I don't want to take the floor at this moment further, but uh, uh, I don't know which of you two will start. Who of you two? Agustin. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much.
on behalf of uh, my co-authors for the invitation to discuss uh, this uh, paper. This paper actually was born, um, I remember quite well, we met with uh, Natalie and, and Frederick in Amsterdam um, during the uh, Dutch presidency just to, to catch up and I was quite excited because I uh, came just from a workshop where the European Commission presented their digital content directive. So then when I when I met and said, oh guys, you, you have to see what the what the commission is, uh, is, is planning to do is that they're going to extend consumer law to data protection. And that is what we started thinking, yeah, it will be actually interesting to start looking at the interplay of these two areas of law that so far had, there had been very little communication from a policy, but also from an uh, enforcement uh, perspective. So we uh, team up, uh, Natalie bringing the um, consumer law dimension, Frederick the data protection, and I uh, contributed with the experience of the consumer organizations who have used um, consumer law actually to tackle data protection uh, infringements. So we started looking uh, and first is uh, kicking off a, a discussion about how these two areas of law interact. And one of the first questions was, what are these areas of law about? And it was a question of fairness. What is fairness in the context of data protection? What is fairness in the context of consumer law? Fairness in the context of, of data protection it concerns about a condition for the collection and the processing of data, while fairness under consumer law is about the fair exchange between two parties. It necessarily has an economic connotation and it also relates to um, the interests that are protected. Consumer law protects the economic interests of consumers. They try to provide the tools so consumers can, be, can make informed choices uh, and not misled by information or practices and also have <coughs> rights in, in case something goes wrong. Well, data protection necessarily protects a personality right, an extension of the personality, and that's what it is in, in the European uh, legal order, a fundamental right itself, where, the, where consumer law is not a fundamental right. So we depart from two completely different uh, perspectives, but that because of reality of the market, they come together. So when we talk about um, uh, these digital services, uh, social networks, how consumers enter into the services is through a contract, or we'll call it a contract, under consumer law. And uh, there are, of course, implications in relation to data protection, the collection, the processing, which, which, which is included in their privacy privacy notices and their requirements in relation uh, specifically in, in relation to the consent um, uh, and so on but the first question that we ask ourselves is what is what is the nature of this contract uh, um, from the consumer associations uh, experience we have used or our members they have used for example the unfair contract terms legislation and it's the um, only EU instrument in consumer law that includes in its scope of application all type of consumer contracts, from energy to financial services, uh, digital, it doesn't matter. It's about contracts. What it is a contract? Well, that's a matter of national law. Is it necessary to have an exchange? Well, these are questions that will be addressed under national law. And then is where we start discussing about this idea of a counter performance. So what do you give in exchange in this type of services where the consumer do not pay? No, some will argue you give personal data or you allow the collection of personal data. You can also argue that it is a matter of attention. You give your time, you, know, you, you, you <coughs> give your attention in order to be able to access these services. That's why on all these uh, video sharing platforms or freemium models for streaming uh, of music, you have advertising before that you can hardly uh, skip because actually the way that you are accessing is through the attention that you pay to access that services. But this has implications in the context, of course, of, of data protection primarily, but also of consumer law. You know, in relation to um, unfair uh, contract terms, this type of services 
the, the basis is on their terms, general terms and condition. And that was uh, been the main target, I would say, of enfor private enforcement by consumer associations in the, in, the, in the recent years, using mainly the unfair contract terms directive and the unfair uh, commercial practices directive. But then we have other areas of law that relates more to imposing specific obligations. So if you look, for example, at the Consumer Rights Directive, it provides specific information obligations or requ formal requirements of how the information needs to be um, uh, displaced. If we look at the field of guarantee rights, which is the main um, uh, scope of the uh, Digital Content Directive uh, proposal, it's about what are your rights if something goes wrong with the service. And for this area, we do not have in the scope a specific mention or specific inclusion of services in which consumers access um, uh, such services or such uh, features in exchange of something else but uh, money. And this is related to the definition in consumer law of a service contract, for example, that requires, requires the, uh, that the consumers takes the obligation, that takes the obligation to provide a monetary, a monetary payment. And then we were discussing actually with, uh, with Natalie and, and Fred, how do we frame this in the context of this type of services? First we discussed, can you consider personal data as a price? But then it was very far reaching uh, conclusion that, well, what is then a counter performance? In many national systems, you have the idea of a counter-performance consideration in, in the UK, in which it expresses the idea that you give something in exchange. What you give, we don't care. There's a matter of how it is defined in the contract, but you give something. But we face the situation in the context of um, uh, data protection, no? that in this case, you will be giving your personal data. And then immediately is how much or to what extent you can dispose from your own personal data in order to enter into such a, a contract. And this is a, a question that rightly so it was pointed out by the uh, EDPS uh, opinion and boils down to the idea is that can we consider personal data as a counter performance itself? Or to put it in different words, how we can ensure that, they, that consumer law can apply to this type of contract without leading to a monetization of the personal data or a commodification of the personal data uh, in itself, which are of course very uh, relevant, uh, relevant question. And one of the ideas was, for example, to have a more broader definition like we have in the e-commerce directive. And that was a, a suggestion of the, of the EDPS opinion in which you don't need to qualify um, what a, a counter performance is. But you can just simply say that in, uh, in these contracts what is any type of remuneration, you know, they will um, be covered by this uh, uh, directive. But on the downside, they will face a situation that what is this type of remuneration will entirely depend on the interpretation of the relevant EU law, but also on the national uh, contract law systems, which will actually qualify what is a contract um, in uh, itself. So in our, in our paper, what we actually uh, conclude is that we need, of course, a much closer look about how you phrase in contract law terms this uh, exchange, but we nevertheless see an added value in extending the consumer law protection to this type of contracts. And um, this kind of address the, the question of why do we need this? What this um, idea of extending consumer law beyond even the digital content proposal, but in general having consumer law applied to this type of, of contracts brings in addition to the general data protection legislation or to uh, privacy law uh, in general. And the um, answer to that question is on the very uh, raison d'etre of the both areas of law. What are the interests that we are um, protecting? And both relates to the fairness elements, the exchange in the case of, co of consumer law that they, the, um, this area of law tries uh, to um, protect, in uh, contrary to data protection that sets the limits about how much data you can ask for the um, from the data subject or consumer, if we if we talk in, in consumer um, uh, law terms. But we will face 
in the future a big challenge which is we are talking about data protection or data as a uh, as an object of exchange but the question of attention is there is for example a market for people's attention and will be the sufficient the rules that we will have in data protection law or the rules that we will have in data protection uh, on on consumer law to address this uh, this phenomenon which is intrinsic of the way these business models run no? and how much interventionist can we afford to be in order to tackle that situation in which people consume on the basis of a need that is created by the same system like you gave the example of the uh, continuous playing or or, or yes the, the 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 idea of the automatic um placement of, of content you know or the click through uh, business models uh, which at the end of the day the only thing to encourage people to consume more even without having necessarily the need to do so but the big question is how much uh, how how much interventions can we afford uh, to be in the future i stop here and i let you continue Fred. Thank you, Hilke, Gloria, and Christian for reading our paper and for all your fascinating comments. So I realized already uh, while we were working at the paper that we should probably write a book. <laughs> now I realize after all your remarks and questions, we should probably set up a whole research institute on the <laughs> interplay of these two fields. Um, but yeah, we only could write a paper. Uh, embarrassing typo oh no we <laughs> we did so <laughs> many jacks of the proofs yeah <laughs> well spotted first footnote too um yeah f first a bit of a meta vega remark um i realize what a fascinating discipline law is so we have consumer law something invented by humans <laughs> data protection law <laughs> something invented by humans and now we're all discussing like how does it interact we have a really weird discipline and people actually come to listen <laughs> to that <laughs> stuff yeah um uh, and one of the people here uh, christian at the adps when he writes stuff it actually becomes sometimes almost law so he influences our research topic again it's fascinating anyways um so Gloria mentioned the false friends between um, data protection law and consumer law. So um, things that seem the same, but after a bit of thought, not. That is true. But regardless of what we say about how the law should develop, law is messy and things are happening. So even if we would decide and that sounds like a that could have been a good decision even if he would have said um, you know what it's better not to mix the two fields we c then there's still consumer organizations coming to judges and we as academics can say uh, on the one hand on the other hand and we can conclude oh it's difficult more research needed but judges always have to decide so whatever we do the two fields do interact because they do in practice and we can't nobody can stop that basically so consumer organizations are suing for data protection stuff um, and in reality how markets work now whether we like it or not uh, yeah. silicon valley companies and <coughs> european startups are hoovering up personal data um, nevertheless we can try to um, think through and try to perhaps influence a bit the messy developments that happen in practice but uh, yeah i wanted to point out we it's happening anyways and now you have the european lawmaker pushing the fields bluntly and harshly together in the digital content directive um yes i like the christian's point that um although personal paying with data is um, like a popular phrase it's actually more correct probably that you pay with attention mm. and in the end by the way uh, the free apps are paid by advertisers mm. eventually the advertisers uh, uh, require that price again from consumers but it's uh, yeah uh, we're not actually paying with personal data um 
I am uh, another point. I am um, like many people on this panel pointed out against seeing privacy or personal data merely as a tradable good. Um, and I don't think that any everything that happened in the market should be uh, legalized. Uh, no, I think the laws should govern the market, and it's not that the market should govern our legal system. By the way, Christian, you say as a rhetorical um, remark, and I uh, agree, well, we wouldn't be selling our organs, would we? This <laughs> I inform you that there are many <laughs> economists say that the <laughs> world would be better if we would allow selling organs. So. Uh, I'm not sure whether you um, convince everybody with that um, remark <laughs> by, by you. Um, oh, and I like the Hilke's idea of um, when you apply Article 7F in data protection law, so that is the article that says legitimate interest provision, sometimes a data controller can publish your personal data without your consent um, if he has a legitimate interest in using your personal data and after balancing that with your rights and freedoms sometimes the correct conclusion is actually the privacy infringement is trivial here um, and the interest of the company is very legitimate let's say of a pizza delivery service to keep your address on file to send you a new menu at new year's or something that could it's probably allowed without your consent because of that legitimate interest provision. And Hilke suggests that perhaps consumer law, because you're here, it's a, it's a rather vague provision, perhaps consumer law can help to help companies, data controllers, to think uh, how they should apply that legitimate interest provision. And I think that makes complete sense because there's, in consumer law, you have, unlike in data protection law, for instance, a long black, or, or more interesting here, a gray list, like circumstances in which is it's yeah. assumed that a contract term is unfair. Y we could probably assume that in situations that somewhat resemble that, uh, a company cannot rely on that balancing provision, for instance. Uh, yeah, so I chose a couple of all your good comments to react on, and if I've forgotten an important one, you can come back. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Frederick. Um, I saw, I heard a lot of interesting uh, issues until now. I would like to open it up uh, to the uh, audience. Uh, one of the things I really find at the heart of a lot of things is, is this trading of personal data. Uh, and one remark before that I would like to make to Frederick, maybe you can react as well. I, I don't think that we can say we pay with our attention. It's uh, instead of paying with our personal data, I think that would make life very, very difficult. But uh, I, I would like to hear a bit more about this because how c it's already difficult to measure uh, personal data, to measure attention, and how does this work? And uh, yeah. But maybe we could explore it a little bit. But maybe uh, before uh, uh, just coming, I'm also uh, perplexed by this paying with attention because uh, then we are consumers when we watch television because we are paying with our attention. We have been paying, so I'm not sure this really gets us to towards a solution. The, the idea of paying our attention. We go to the cinema. We pay with our attention because we we are in the product placement over over. So I don't know. Uh, how is this new of paying with the attention? I don't know. Uh, well, we paying attention is a, is a is an idiom. So <laughs> there must be something in it. Uh, so these devices and software are designed deliberately to addict people. We know that, and it's uh, particularly children. Uh, there's a big case in China this year, um, and people are starting to analyse the the, eth the ethical implications of that and the longer term consequences for um, for society. Um, and so that, yes, it's it's really difficult, but just because it's difficult, we shouldn't ignore it. The, it's about trying to interrogate this transaction which is taking place where people are not handing over their credit card or cash um, to use a search engine or um, to have things proposed to them on an e-commerce site, etc. There's something going on there, and, and regulators are not really understanding it yet. They're trying to use the old ter old tools, and even where they're trying to modernise, like with the digital content direct directive proposed, 
they slip back, as you say in your article, they slip back to monetary transactions. They they can't they can't take it much further. They don't know how to do it. So that's why there needs to be a lot more reflection on this. Um, and you can, I mean, Tim Tim Wu is has been has made some suggestions, but they are trying to offer some metrics for how you can. He uses the metaphor of attention being like you have a you have a, a a bunch of coins in your pocket, and you have a hole in your pocket, and everywhere you go, like you're dropping coins, and um, there's a limited amount, um, and that's basically like your attention, which is finite and uh, and has a price. I don't. Yeah, I think I think this is a good maybe a whole novel element of our discussion here. Great. Frederick, um, I should have been clearer. With um, uh, I wasn't at all suggesting that the law should regard people as paying with their attention, and that should be a kind of trigger. I was just saying, if you look at it with com at current use of uh, so-called free apps or so-called free websites, then uh, a common sense or economic if you look at that through an uh, economic lens or just with common sense, saying that people pay with their attention is a better description of what happens in fact than paying with personal data. That was my point. I'm not at all suggesting um, uh, that, uh, uh, that the law should use paying with attention as a trigger for contract law. Uh, yeah. yeah. I forgot. That's seen and then yeah, I open it up very, very briefly on that point, I totally agree with what um, Frederick said. What is clear is that there is a market for people's attention. Like there have been a market since the commercial broadcasters, you know, uh, started their their business model time long, 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 long time ago. But I do see um, a difference is that this, this market has became uh, more competitive in the sense that there are more people actually or uh, films interested to get uh, to the consumers' uh, screens. And what is uh, interesting is that, for example, when it comes to advertising um, in the traditional media, you know, there are specific rules actually to apply to that. So, for example, in, in television, you can have advertising uh, of certain type of content at certain uh, hours or uh, even limited the amount of advertising that you placed. But this is something that we don't have at all whatsoever in the digital, uh, in the digital world. Uh, you get advertising 24-7 all the time and the whole idea behind is trying to maximize these um, advertising revenues the maximum possible and that's through the exploitation of people's attention but the exploitation of people's attention can even cross very delicate lines you know i think everybody's aware of the practices that facebook was deploying uh, in identifying the vulnerabilities of teenagers you know in order to maximize the advertising space and be able to tell to advertisers look you know I know how to explode on, on what is the best moment that you can play certain type of, adver of advertising. That is about exploiting the people's attention in a way that is completely different than what has happened in, uh, in the past. And policymakers need to look at this development as well. One brief remark. Super brief. Actually, sometimes the law does seem to see uh, paying with attention as kind of paying. At least uh, in European Union, we have strict laws, even for commercial TV channels, how much advertising they can put on per hour. Yeah, yeah. But this is why perhaps it's not so new, or it, it's uh, reproduced in a model that it's, uh, I think, from the 1930s, that there were the first demographic studies of the, the radio, the content of the radio has been adapted to, to, the, con to the demographic information that people have. So it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a long history, and that's the way we have until now regulated this attention thing. Let me uh, open it now to the floor with maybe the, the first question, whether or not paying with attention is something which can be dealt with under privacy law or under consumer law. But please go ahead. Uh, or both, on all topics. But go ahead. Uh, please come, f yeah. maybe come forward and the camera can see you. Please say, please say your name. And Malise Zomer from the Secretariat of the European Parliament, working for the Internal Market and Consumer Affairs Committee. We're a whole bunch of people here from the Secretariat and the political side of the House, and all of us are working on the Digital Content Directive. 
Specifically on this point of paying with your attention, I think we shouldn't forget that there's actually a review clause already in the Commission proposal, proposal of the Digital Content Directive that looks into the possibility of opening up the scope of that directive to covering contracts in exchange for watching advertisement. It's probably an early day to already do it. The Parliament has considered it actually to, to cover those uh, contracts already. But indeed you run into the definition of a contract which is different in different member states. There was a clear majority in both uh, the Council and the Parliament not to harmonize the definition of a contract under for the purpose of this directive. Um, but it has been tempting to already cover it now, but so we're for the moment we're all keeping it in the review clause, but we're not so far from indeed thinking of regulating uh, that aspect of, of paying with your attention. Uh, first, another remark. So uh, that's super interesting. I completely missed that. But um, uh, we could also take a step back and think. Um, uh, many people say that there's a gap in consumer law because um, many services that people use hours each day and that can cause damage, etc. Um, are not paid for with money, so fall outside the scope, largely fall outside the scope of current consumer law. Um, I agree with that problem analysis. In you could, so therefore you need to find a trick if you want to solve that problem to get those services under the scope of consumer law. One tr trick is the attempt in the di digital content directive, the data as counter performance but there could have been other ways right it, 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 um, it was not the only trigger possible to apply digital um, uh, to ap uh, apply so-called free services um, no to put so-called free services under um, consumer law we can't um, uh, the digital content directive will just have to see what happens there but um, yeah we just wanted to point out I, I don't think this is the only trigger that is possible to um, yeah. apply consumer law on uh, non paid with money services yeah. but for can I ask you how does how would, how would this work under data protection law uh, how would what how, work? how do you protect people under data protection law uh, against paying with your attention mm, not yeah it's <laughs> so it's more a, a matter of said of, of media law if, if we look at the um, uh, the rules on uh, advertising in the broadcasting sector and there they are quite specific um, provisions but they apply independently of existence of a contract or not uh, so the idea of, of consumer law is to look at when there is a, a necessarily an, an exchange it does not necessarily we don't necessarily have need to have a contract you know to address the question of the Adver uh, of the adverti of the advertising or the attention economy in itself you know we have experiences also in the in the um, in, in media law while consumer law necessarily protects the economic interest of um, of people this doesn't mean that there could not be any type of interactions between uh, consumer law and media law and, and data protection law because at the end of the day the um, basis for all the services it's a contract even when you go on a search engine, you know the the contract terms apply by tacit collusion uh, for by tacit uh, so collusion by tacit um, uh, agreement really? by using yes by using the service you agree on the terms and conditions. No? But that's what the terms and conditions say. But would the judge accept it? Well, that depends on the definition of a contract and the national law. Oh, yeah. And there are many national systems that actually allow or they consider that there could be a tacit conclu uh, conclusion of, uh, of a contract and unfortunately um, especially member states have not been keen to harmonize um, the conclusion of a contract we had this discussion when the consumer right uh, the um, sorry the um, yes the consumer directive but also when the e-commerce directive was discussed articles 9 to 11 which then the commission proposal they seek to harmonize 
the moment of the conclusion of a, of a contract, the condition for the conclusion of a contract, but member state, they felt that it interfered too much mm -hmm. into the national system. So at the end of the day, it was limited just to a mere uh, set of information uh, requirements as some, requ uh, some specific um, uh, condition for concluding a contract, but not really harmonizing key uh, aspects of um, con contract conclusion. But as long as we uh, have national laws, we always have this question of whether in one country a tacit conclusion will be a valid, legal, or in another country um, it's not. GDPR uh, should be able to help, first of all, the principle of data minimization, that you're not supposed to um, you're supposed to only collect the data that's necessary. Um, but then also uh, data protection by design requirements should, should um, lead to um, services being designed in such a way that they um, they respect the um, the interests of, of the individual and that they minimize the um, unnecessary data processing um, but I I don't think I, I think there's there's sometimes too much of an obsession with advertising um, I don't think you know Google and Facebook are collecting as much data as possible because they want to sell it to advertisers. I mean, they're, they're diversifying, they're moving into other ways of monetizing it. And the, the principle is, um, and, and if you think about Snapchat, the this streaks um, thing where you, you basically, uh, kids, teenagers feel utterly um, compelled to keep a streak with different friends going every day, even if they don't have access to the internet to the extent that they're giving their passwords to friends. I mean, th th that's addiction. That's pure addiction. So how, how is that to be dealt with? I'm not sure it's data protection law there. Um, you mentioned media law. I think that's crucial, media plurality. And they're start, they're, people are now thinking we need to regulate these platforms because people are, are consuming content through platforms rather than through a diverse media. Uh, so, yeah. <coughs> so, a comment, and uh, a question for Frederick, because I'm a bit surprised that you say, well, data protection perhaps cannot do anything, but I think when we think about uh, online practices and this kind of applications, the, the tricky thing is that, so I was mentioning radio and television, I think many of the problems that this attention and addiction, creating addiction is, is the paradigm of television. Television, modern television is about creating addiction in children. It's uh, very clear, but the, the, the novel thing is really this link between gathering data and delivering the targeted ads. And this is perhaps, I think you, you, you're one of the w uh, fields where you have been working very much. I think we, we cannot really separate this or be separate this in a very artificial way. We collect data to deliver the ads and we, uh, we deliver ads and, and, and we keep collecting data about the way in which the ads were, were uh, processed and whether they were effective ads. So that it's, it's a dual, uh, it's a double movement that is all the time ongoing. We can regulate the ads whether we want to give, uh, if you go sometimes to the Disney Channel uh, thing on YouTube, I, it has happened to me going on the Disney Channel thing of YouTube and you get uh, ads for beer. Like probably like uh, yes, this this happens for real. I think that media law has to do something, child protection, whatever has to do something. But there is a data protection side to it, which is that data has been collected on the fact that maybe the children are watching this with the father or the mother, and they want to have a beer, whatever. But this there's a dual side, and it is other side of the constant gathering of data, also on the way in which you respond to ads. Their data protection has to be something doing some to something. Privacy has to do something. You could, yes, that's if you are part of the minority that knows about the ad blockers, you, 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 you will do it. But how many people do this? It all depends a bit on the business model, I think. Uh, someone else. Fukuyama. Uh, should I repeat it? Uh, I, you can install an ad blocker uh, and then you can prevent of paying attention to this type of publicity. Uh, I will. I will open the floor. I see a question behind, and there again. Which one first? The woman behind, and then our colleague from the European Parliament. Uh, please uh, say your name and where you're from. And hi, I'm. J Hi, I'm Jennifer Kramer from the uh, EDPS. I'm a trainee in policy and consultation. Um, I have more of a question, really, because under consumer law, if I'm considered incompetent to enter into an agreement, I have a representative that looks out for me. And I'm not talking about minors right now. I'm talking about 
grown people, for example, with addiction problems. Um, now, I've been hearing recently a lot of complaints coming from people that say, oh, I'm the representative of a person who wasn't allowed to enter into an agreement, and they downloaded this app, and they are paying using their social media by constantly posting and sharing data in this app. But when I go to the Dutch uh, Consumer Authority, they send me to the Data Protection Authority. And when I go to the Data Protection Authority, they send me back to the Consumer Authority. What do these representatives have to do, and which law should start regulating this? I think now we opened up a new uh, chapter of our discussion, mainly okay. on enforcement and enforcement cooperation. Please uh, react. Very, very quickly. I think that's um, it's a very good example of the current situation and something you have said at the beginning, this working together, the enforcement angle, who is responsible for what at the end of the day. And like you know, a governmental body, an agency will do a strictly the minimum necessary and what the law tells them to do. So far, a consumer, um, a consumer authority, for example, they have not been competent to deal with this type of questions. Despite the fact that, for example, the unfair con uh, contract terms directive would apply to all types of contracts. So eventually, you could even argue that they were already competent to deal with this type of discussion. But with all these very complex questions of the interplay between data protection and, and, and consumer law, they are um, still in a very, very early stage. And this is where they need, really need the push. And I'm very glad that the EDPS have taken the initiative trying to bring them together. Because at the end of the day, uh, a question uh, of um, contractual validity you know, could concern to a large extent uh, the data protection uh, issues or um, or the or the other the other way around the specific question for example of the um, representation you know, that's purely a national competence so they will really be defined by the national laws you know who has the uh, authority to represent somebody else um, for different reasons even in the case of uh, of children you have different national threshold about what is uh, a minor and therefore, when the representation, the legal representation of the of the parents um, uh, kicks in, so that's a question that we always have. But the other important element is the um, vulnerability uh, aspects, and this is something that EU law has a lot to say because we have, uh, specifically in the area of uh, consumer law, specific rules that deal with uh, people in, uh, with vulnerabilities, you know? and we'll, we'll think that it's time perhaps to move a little bit a little bit on and start thinking of a people in a situation of vulnerability which is different from a vulnerable consumer because i am a person in a situation of vulnerability when i have to discuss for example the conditions of my uh, mortgage contract i have no clue about financial services you know? or the same happened with a, with a person that have to engage for example even with the terms and conditions of, of Facebook or, or so on, we're talking about very complex uh, questions. So there are people that are by, by default in these uh, situations that will require the special attention of the legislator and the enforcers. And therefore, I think that the, uh, when it comes to protecting consumers in situations of vulnerability, the consumer protection agencies have a lot to say there because they have in their own enforcement traditions and competencies dealing with um, uh, vulnerable vulnerable consumers. The question is also, of course, do we have the legal framework that address this type of, uh, of situations? I think this is indeed a good example why, uh, for instance, data protection authorities can very well benefit from the experience which consumer authorities have. Uh, it's an issue which is hardly addressed, for instance, in GDPR, which is all about cooperation between data protection authorities, but not at all about uh, cooperation across the board with others, with other authorities, with the same kind of, which deal quite often with the same kind of issues. But of course, the GDPR allows this completely. I wanted to, re you had a question, I think. Yes, yes. good afternoon. 
So a, a question from the European Parliament side as well. I will um, start with a, a personal example. I've got a Facebook account and then uh, so I give uh, data necessary for the performance of the contract. It, me it means my email address and my date of birth, if even if I can I say uh, whatever uh, date of birth I wanted. And then when I click on the Find the Friends button, and then my data is, uh, uh, is transferred to other parties without me consenting to it. There is also the uh, transfer from WhatsApp to uh, other Facebook uh, uh, services uh, in the post-merger. So it uh, uh, links me to the distinctions, as touched upon by uh, Dr. Frederic uh, Zuderven, on uh, GDPR Article 6a uh, and B, mean consent, the two grounds for, for collecting and processing data, consent, and what is necessary for the performance of uh, the contract. Uh, during the discussion on digital content, we are phase of how to distinguish a line between uh, 6A, uh, 61A and B. Uh, the line is, uh, so the, the boundaries are very blurred, I would say. Industry play, no, everything is necessary for the performance of the contract, which is not the case. So would you have examples or case law uh, which would help us to distinguish between these two grounds, consent, and necessary for the performance of the contract. Thanks. Frederick. Um, I, um, I understand, yeah, I understand your question. Two people who don't know the uh, data protection law by heart by article. Uh, in European data privacy law, sometimes a company uh, can use some of your personal data and the company does not have to ask you for consent, for instance when the use of the personal data is necessary to deliver a service. So if you subscribe to a newspaper, newspaper can only send you the newspaper if it has your address. So therefore, the newspaper publisher does not have to ask your consent to store your address because otherwise they couldn't deliver the newspaper to your house, right? That's a classic example of necessary for a contract. If the newspaper wants to use your same personal data, sell it to others, it's clearly not necessary for the contract. European law says um, the newspaper would have to ask consent. Newspapers and online uh, startups try to blow up that, um, try to enlarge that provision because for some reason many companies uh, decided two things. First, they want to collect data for a targeted ad and second they decide we don't want to ask consent so therefore they try to blow up the other legal basis uh, i don't know case law by heart but um, i agree with what um, article 29 working party so 28 data protection authorities together has been saying that says um, no only data that are really necessary uh, for delivering the service let's say that are comparable to sending the newspaper to your home uh, should um, f uh, only such data uses should fall under that uh, necessary for the contract clause by the way there is an interesting article 29 working party from last week on consent which might be interesting for your work as well they just published it uh, one week ago Yes, so perhaps to just even complicate things further, there is also the legitimate interest of the data controller. So it's not only whether it's part of the contract or, or it's consent, but you could say, well, it's uh, covered by the legitimate interest of the, of the data controller. So there are di indeed different bases. The boundaries are not clear. And what it, for me it's also funny is that the, then it has implications for the rights, such as data portability. That depending on which was the legal ground, you will have different rights. And, and is, how this, is this fair for somebody that you don't really know as a data subject which one, uh, which uh, was more the basis for, for the tr uh, processing. Therefore, you don't have a clue about your rights as, as, as a data subject. So it, it's, a, it's a very, very delicate question and an important one, but we don't have answers. I'm afraid. There is some interesting thing in what the working party says, for instance. They, they say that in under GDPR, there's a change taking place. You cannot just swap as a controller from a uh, legal basis. So you say consent because someone's talking. Uh, uh, retrieves this content, consent, and then do the same thing on legitimate, inter legitimate interest. They say that's not no longer possible. Yeah. So that's interesting. Swapping of legal basis is so difficult. Yeah. And, and there's also a parallel discussion on this point in relation to the e-privacy regulation. Yeah. So um, huge 
push back against the idea that you should consent to being tracked online on the basis that that isn't really necessary in order to deliver an online service um, and and then you get the um, I mean if, if it's a contract then to what extent what what is a what is a contract and is there is there fairness in the between the parties <coughs> The case, I was just thinking about the Breyer case, which was about uh, the, whether is it really necessary to process some data yeah. for the security of the deliberate web secure website. That would be uh, an interesting one. Who else? Yeah. I have a question. Um, I'm Who are you? Hi, I'm Sarah Bevernage from uh, Altis Lawyers. So I had a discussion with one of my colleagues um, about a topic, pay me for your data. And he said, like, okay, when you conclude a contract, the contract states one of the elements is you will provide me this and that personal data. In return, you will get this service. Then you have concluded a contract under Belgian national law. So the contract is actually valid. And the elements you have to pay this and that personal data is an element to perform the contract. So actually, um, giving this personal data is necessary in order to perform the contract because it has been one of the core elements of the contract. I don't know what your opinion is on this. Uh, actually, there was um, uh, a problem that we identify with the Commission proposal itself, that the application of the uh, rules of the directive will depend that the contract stipulates what is the uh, contract performance. So I can also, as a company, say nothing about what is the counter performance of the data relevant uh, elements of the counter performance, and that these rules will not simply not apply, because this is the intrinsic problem with the idea of a counter performance. You need to specify what is it that you give uh, in exchange. If you don't say nothing, these rules uh, do not apply. So that was a, a, an issue that we we try also to clarify and to work. Um, with the with the European Parliament uh, and the and the Council, and the idea will be that you don't need to make dependent the application of these rules on the specification in the contract or that what is the data that you're providing in exchange. The ultimate idea is that these contracts are covered by a mandate of the law and not of the parties defining what is the counter performance in the contract that will uh, trigger the application of the of the rules in in, in itself. Something. Yeah, very briefly. Um, I think data protection law, no, I'm sure, is mandatory law. Um, so I don't think um, you can draw up vali co valid contracts um, basically bypassing data protection law just as uh, uh, I can enter, I, I can draft a contract saying with a pregnant lady i will buy your baby afterwards or or, <laughs> or i can hire or i can hire a contract killer but it's all contrary to mandatory law and therefore yeah not valid Perhaps to, to come back to me, my idea of the false friends, I think here is, there is a very technical uh, pro clash between some false friends that it indeed, so the, the, for this new directive, you will be able to consent to accept this transaction that you're giving the data, but for data protection law, if you consent, you accept a transaction, you enter a contract, you cannot consent, it's not consent in the terms of the data protection. So there, there, there are some clashes, a paradox, but it's, it's perhaps only a terminological one. Mm. Perhaps if we scratch under the surface, it works. Any further questions? Yeah. In the Parliament's position on the Digital Content Directive, we're taking the interplay between um, consumer law and data protection law to an even higher level. I don't know if you've noticed in two crucial amendments in the Parliament position. One is on, yeah. on non-conformity, uh, Article 6A, Paragraph B. Sorry for the technicalities. Um, so objective conformity requirements, and there the Parliament is saying um, that conformity not only relates to whether the digital content is in conformity with the contract or objective requirements as you would as a reasonable consumer expect it to be, so no security bugs, no flaws in, in delivery, etc. But the Parliament's amendment is saying if um, 
any there's any infringement of data protection rules in delivering the digital content or service, then automatically this amounts to non-conformity, and this would trigger the remedy system yeah. under the digital content directive. So, um, meaning this hierarchy of remedies, bringing back into conformity or price reduction as a second step or termination. So that's one extra bit, and we're we're now referring to the entire GDPR. But what the MEPs had in mind who wrote this is that. They were actually thinking of Article 25 on privacy by design. Um, so if, if the digital content is not conceived in line with privacy by design um, requirements and by default, then this would amount to a non-conformity of the product, objective non-conformity of the product, and this would trigger the consumer remedies, so not just the GDPR remedies that also exist. So th this would be a parallel enforcement system, a private one, next to the public one under the GDPR. So that that yeah, that's the first example. But maybe we can discuss this one first. Fascinating. So um, <coughs> yeah, super interesting. So. Uh, that could be done more often, basically, in consumer law. Then can also sidestep many of the difficult discussions, like how do we um, uh, how do we apply consumer law to so-called free services? You just add a clause and say, if you violate mandatory law in your contract, such as blah 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 and data protection law, but you could also say minimum food safety standards, etc. Then all the uh, all the remedies from this regulation or directive apply. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's well that um, it's funny because in the in the context of uh, unfair contract terms, we were saying before, um, if an unfair term will contravene a mandatory uh, provision, then that that term will be automatically void, yeah. not because of a the grounds of unfairness or the grounds of the uh, uh, illegality of deviating from a mandatory provision. But on this uh, specific point, it's, it's different because the effect of, of um, no, the non-binding effect of a clause is the same whether you declare unfair or you declare illegal because it deviates from mandatory uh, legislation. Well, here is different because it's not about it, uh, the um, the deviation or the um, violation of data protection law will not necessarily trigger the contractual uh, remedies for lack of conformity. And there is where we have the added value in comparison to the situation that we have with unfair terms. So that's, uh, I think, yes, indeed. Uh, I, w I would also say there is quite some added value by specifying, like you do with privacy by design, data protection by design. That makes sense, I think, because it, these are so vague terms. So if you specified it in the law, then you get you have really get a trigger for but enforcement. Th th I that think that was my, my question. What what is the the added value of specifying it uh, beyond the rhetorics? Because it's uh, if you say the first possibility is to say well you have to comply with the, the GDPR requirements, which include privacy by design and privacy by default. The, I think the the option of saying you have to include uh, pr uh, respect GDPR and privacy by design and default. Uh, I don't know whether the rhetoric uh, effect is better, but I don't know whether it's, it's not only it's not only rhetoric. I think, but. Uh, yeah, the, I think the added value, for example, will be given if you think of um, s more a smart toy or a smart, a smart device, uh, in which um, in the traditional consumer law sense or conformity sense will, will not be in breach of the law because it possesses all the functionalities and so on. But the fact that the requirement of being uh, of having incorporated privacy as uh, um, uh, from the design and all the requirements of, of the GDPR, the fact that you're not complying with these requirements will enable you to apply the contract law remedies that you have under consumer law that today wouldn't be able to do it, which means that terminating the contract or eventually telling them, look, you know, you need to remedy these products or to make it GDPR compliant. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it's yeah, it adds, adds a lot to the current situation because you will not be able to yeah, terminate the contract. GDPR reference, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, Sorry, what is the EDPS thinking of this mixing of enforcement, of, of remedy systems, basically? That, uh, well, it's not a done deal, of course. This is in the Parliament's position, but it's very controversial for the member states and for the Commission. So we're in inter-institutional negotiations now, and we're meeting a lot of opposition with, with this one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, th thanks for mentioning it because we, we, we I mean, I, I haven't, um, I, I hadn't noticed it, although I'm not working on this uh, personally. Um, I can't give you an official opinion uh, wow. right now, but um, uh, in principle, um, anything which encourages the laws to be to be operated, to, to be implemented in tandem, to be enforced in tandem is a good thing because the... Um, uh, it's 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 a bit like with antitrust uh, you know the you you can you can be in violation of two two different laws at the same time and uh what we're trying to do is is update the rule book for for digital digital reality and and if and if it means you you give a you give a specific like endorsement in co consumer law of um, designing products in a way which look after the interests of the consumer, including their their right to data protection, then I can't see uh, personally how that could be anything other than a good thing. Um, but that's not an official opinion. You want to? Go? Yeah, please. Yeah, sorry, and that's that's very good to hear and encouraging to to hear. Um, the commission has been maintaining for more than two years now that there is no interference at all between data protection rules and EU consumer protection law. There is none and there shouldn't be and we should at all costs avoid that uh, we're interpreting the GDPR as well. That's why for the moment we haven't mentioned explicitly Article 25, even, even not simply mention it, but are referring to the entire GDPR which is a bit overdoing it because someone told us that if a company wouldn't have appointed a data controller um, individual, it would already be in violation of the GDPR and all the contracts would be affected uh, and could trigger the remedy system. So we, shouldn't, we should probably limit it to Article 25, really. But so, yeah, the Commission seems to be extremely eager to keep the systems, the remedy systems, separate, to, to not cause any interference. But I think your example, counterexample of, uh, of, of uh, antitrust law is, is a very good point in the sense that we're doing it already. We're, we have different legal means of enforcing the same uh, principles. Yeah, well, look, I mean, there, 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 is a, there are people who think believe in the sort of purity of different legal regimes and that they shouldn't be adulterated there shouldn't be any leakage between them and that's that's a legitimate position to take um what what we've been saying is if you look strategically now at what's happening to people and in markets um these these categories are in are are, are shaking and so either you you may want one route is to actually uh write a kind of cross-cutting law um i don't know how, to what extent the legal services would be happy with that. Another route, which is what we're pursuing, is just trying to get the regulators together to look at specific cases. So in a sense, it shouldn't really be necessary for there to be a uh, some sort of passerelle between um, data protection and consumer because th they ought to be enforced coherently anyway. But a real life example of what's happening now, you mentioned antitrust. Um, all the whole antitrust community is on um, is on tenterhooks waiting to see what the German Bundeskartellamt is going to do in their Facebook terms and conditions case because that they really they are really trying to explore the um, the common ground between um, the antitrust uh, article 102 of the treaty which says that the, um, uh, exploitation of the consumer of the consumer by a dominant company is is um, is abusive um, unfair terms and conditions which have a, a basis in consumer law and and in um, and in data protection law insofar as data disclosure is concerned so this is happening anyway the question is what's the best way of what's the best way of doing it I think also, but I don't speak in the name of anyone, that the Commission should move a little bit on this, but uh, that's my personal opinion, and I don't uh, represent anyone. Uh, anyone else? If not from the floor, I give you all 
one closing remark and then we close this whole session. Uh, I'll start the other way around, starting with Frederick this time. Uh, thanks again everybody for coming and for the great inspiring remarks and I hope that the paper was, that's, that's also how it was meant, uh, um, an invitation for people to write and think more and to uh, um, join, a, to, how it is, to build the discussions in journals and on panels and uh, like we do here. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. We hope that this is just the starting of this uh, debate. I think that there are room for a lot of other articles, also looking at other interplays between uh, data protection, antitrust, consumer law and antitrust, and the three of them together. Media law, I think, is an important area to uh, discuss also in the, in the context of this um, uh, attention economy. So actually very, very happy that we were able to contribute to this debate. Maybe as a uh, if we can uh, abuse of your attention <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> some advertising, <laughs> we will have uh, the, um, uh, the um, CPDP, a panel about... Good yeah, <laughs> that's good advertising. We will have um, a panel uh, on the, the, the perfect match, but also looking from the uh, as a transatlantic uh, dimension, looking at the um, uh, EU, um, US uh, debate and how actually the US have attempted to protect uh, privacy through the rules on advertising um, and therefore we'll have a, an interesting panel um, with the, uh, yes it's on the 24th and we'll have the um, rapporteur of the digital content uh, directive uh, Julie Brill ex uh, FTC that now is on uh, Microsoft um, we'll have uh, who else Cool and are, uh, many cool speakers so you're happy to <laughs> join us and continue this debate now from a transatlantic perspective thank you yes. uh, i would just like to thank the, the authors for for being here to remind you this february 20th uh, there will be another uh, continuation of, of this discussion actually with also agustin he confirmed he, he will be there yeah. speaking again uh, I just wanted to, to clarify that I made this. Uh, I talked about the differences between consumer law and data protection law. I was not trying, of course, to keep them separated. I don't think they should be separated. I actually think one of the best things that has happened for data protection law in the last years is the uh, the, the Norwegians, uh, the, the representatives of the consumers uh, in, in Norway. They are doing a great job just showing how uh, privacy infringing are many applications and especially uh, gadgets for children. That's, that's there are many things to be to be further explored. I just think while we explore this in practice at a regulatory level, from the academic perspective, it's worthwhile to think what are the implications, the assumptions that we are just uh, playing with. And yes, thank you very much. Thanks again to the authors. And um, th this, th this is um, this is a long-term strategic um, challenge for 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 regulators um, and for anyone who cares about um, consumer rights and data protection rights, um, because uh, we need to start to think together about um, the longer term impact of, of mergers, um, ever, ever more powerful companies and what that means for, for, for the individual. Um, thank you. I thank you all in the name of the Privacy Hub. It was great to have you all. Uh, I'm also very curious about what will happen in the European Parliament with the Digital Content Directive as a, as a follow up. Um, there are several next events to go to. Uh, the CPDP event with Julie Brill must be excellent, and of course the other event of 20 February as well. We, in this series, will continue as well on a Meet the Author series somewhere in March probably, but the date and subject will be uh, commu uh, communicated to you. Thank you all for coming, and uh, we close. <laughs>